I'm good at teach. This is Mike. I wanted to have a talk, kind of teaching, but nothing real spectacular about the title of this teaching and doctrine and talk. Christ in the middle of things, Christ in the midst of things. That that word is prominent in the Bible. It's been four, five, six, seven times. Christ in the midst, Christ in the midst, Christ in the midst. And I want to talk about, well, I'll, I'll talk more out of my heart. You know, there's no spectacular title here. And uh, I think it's over the years, and you've heard me speak that I have served the Lord 40 years or so, but and I have. Uh, a, a, a 40 years is a, a bunch of time. A lot of things happened in 40 years, but and uh, my father was born in, in the 20s, 1920s, and my grandfather was born in, and my mother's side was born in 1882. So he brought a lot with him too, and I, I learned a lot from him. I spent much time with my grandfather and grandmother. I loved my grandma. She was born in 1892. My mom was born in. In 1933, she's 92 or 3 now. She's still alive. Garth, our garden the other day. The Internet's a wonderful thing. You can just look in and have face-to-face -face with each other. But people in, in my dad's age, age bracket lived through a tremendous revolution, evolution of things. I was born in 55. was after Korea. And uh, uh, I just loved history. And I drove in 40, 40s vehicles and learn how to drive in 50 vehicles and, and uh, radio sets came out and little radios and before that but I got the end of those things you couldn't synchronize things you try to get the frequency back and you take vengeance on it trying to dial it back in now television was there I was a remote control for many years we had a little black and white set in the beginning but I look over my lifetime, the tremendous strides, both negative and positive, that have been made in human society. They've been, to say the least, have, have made tremendous, tremendous technological advances. Tre tremendous. We have experienced a, a devolution in, in sociologically, I believe that. I do. There's been a decline, and not only a decline in what we call unregenerated society, among those who don't profess to know Christ, but... There's been something of a decline among those who do know Christ. Now, I probably shouldn't say that because I don't want to bring any calumny on any of the people of God because I love them. That's not my desire. I love the people of God. I love God's church. I do. But I think if there's anything that an older person does is he takes on the role of a watchman. I do believe that, and he should. And he should look from the vantage point of his years and experience of what's going on. And that's not good. That's not good. You know, you look at things, you go, that's not good, that's not good. And a number of things that are good. But there's a number of things that do concern me. Things, uh, to put it simply as possible, is that many Christian people are taking taking up peripheral things. They always did, rather than which that's which is central. I went to breakfast with an apostle one time, and he was an apostle an older man, a lawyer as well, very studious, very smart. And I didn't talk. He wanted to go to breakfast. I said, I'd love to go to breakfast with you. I worked as a contractor, AC contractor in Louisiana, a mechanical contractor, statewide plumbing and, and uh, air conditioning, heating, whatever, commercial and residential. But I was doing some work for him, and he did a little work for me law-wise. He had a law practice, but he said, come to lunch, come to breakfast with me, I want to talk with you. I did. I was a young minister, and he was an older apostle. And he said, I, he, one statement that he made to me, which stood, stood out, society-wise and with the Lord, he said, don't worry too much about the sins that haunt you. You'll get rid of those. They'll, they'll be along the way. But I want you to remember, do what Jesus tells you to do. The last thing he told you to do. And as a watchman, I, I look at those things. And I found that people get stuck in those peripherals of those sins that so easily beset them that they miss the main point, the main view, the main central point. Now, it's not unusual to see 
the great hullabaloo about something that's really peripheral. You know, it's in the Bible, but and it is Christian, but it's peripheral. It's it's not the central. It's not the central theme. It's not major, and it, it that's a kind of heresy, I think. I, I believe so. It's a kind of heresy when you major on the peripheral things and neglect the major things. Uh, that's a heresy to me. I mean, we throw out a lot of Christians with that. This is one of the things concerning me greatly is that heresy. That's all it is. And this in turn is reflected in social society and the cavalier manner in which they handle a number of moral problems in nothing more than and less than a spin off from carelessness in, in the moral and ethical and theological standards within the church. Now, so that we have now things that when I was young, we didn't even talk about them. They didn't talk about the church at all. And now they're pretty rampant. They talk about them now. I talk about them. The whole matter of abortion. <clears throat> That's a scandal. It's a scandal. I wonder how long God's going to withhold his judgment from America. And his, wonder, his beautiful, strong hands from this mass murder of life that's most, that has its most promising potential point. Pure, full of potential, ready to be birthed in this world and then snuffed out. In such a little cavalier and, and, and deliberate manner that uh, the president of the, the vice president of the United States just went into a, a, a butcher shop. They commit tremendous violations of murder abortions, and said, I don't know why any of us hadn't been here before. We're for you. And they call them women's rights. We're for women's rights. You have a right to your body. That's called murder. And what they're doing is 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 lobbying for murder. I, I don't care what you guys think. Whoever thinking said, well, different circumstances, it's okay. No, it's never okay. It's never okay. If you go into the territory that Jesus has you go into as far as his word goes, there are promises. Some get them, some don't. I won't lie about that. I've seen them. I've seen miraculous things, and I've seen devastating things. And one wouldn't know why. I don't know why. In certain areas, I don't know why. But that doesn't make me throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'm not going to. At all. I just don't believe in this cavalier way of nonchalantly killing your kid. And by the way, there are a lot of men that are very, very angry that women have killed their children without talking to them at all. There's others that are, that are betas. They, they don't really care. But there are a lot of alphas out there, and, and, and yes, they, they do care. They care a lot. Attitude towards sex has to take two. Premarital sex is taken it's for granted in a large part of society. And the state where I have lived before, California and other states now, but there's many young people living together than without marriage as there are with marriage, period. Marriage is under attack. It's been under attack for many years. and I don't need to go on with that, but, but I'm talking about this and what I want to talk about. My concern to say to you in, in this teaching is that if you've got a heart for reality, you know, we need to start to address that which is central, not peripheral. And it's only if we emphasize what God emphasizes that we're going to get kind of results that God wants us to have. And we listen to him, if you won't get the negative things that hate you so much. Now, I want to talk to you about Jesus Christ tonight. Seven times in the New Testament. Seven. And I don't want to deal with all seven of them, but don't get nervous about this teaching. But seven times in the New Testament, in the midst, it's, this phrase reoccurs seven times, in the midst. Now, in the midst, I'm going to refer to only two of them and, and give you... Give me one of them right now. Probably already know this. You already know it real well. Where two or three are gathered together, where two or three are gathered together in their midst, in my name, there I am in the midst. Two or three gathered together, in my name, I'm in the midst. What I want to say to you in this teaching more than anything is this: Jesus Christ must be central to everything. This is what I've learned. This is what I read. And, and notice I didn't say religion. No, no religion. And I didn't say some brand of religions either. I didn't say ethics, and I didn't say morality. Now, over here, I didn't say nice, and you, know, you can put a whole lot of things in there. But you probably associate with Christianity, but I didn't say those things. I said that Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ, the historical person, the risen living person, the one who is alive and lives at God's right hand right now, 
that Jesus Christ must be central to everything, I'm going to make a sweeping statement at this point, too, because another failing on the part of us Christians and overall, and it's been better, is that we're inclined to be propriority, propriorial about Jesus Christ. We don't want to bother him about certain things. We don't need to. God so loved the world that he gave his own but son, his only begotten son. He gave his son to the world. Christ came into the world, tasted death for every, for every man, every person. Christ is a world figure. Now, this is probably going to be shocking to, to some of us who are inclined to be obscurant. We were proprietorial. We, we got Jesus all fixed up in our little box, you know. He's ours. Don't touch him. Don't, don't touch him. I don't mean it. Well, he's ours. And, and all of our problems. Now, I'm going to read this to you. I wrote it down, but I want to read it. And I read a lot of this. I just need to stay on cue. All of our problems, whether Christianly or worldly, well, they come from, from removing Christ from the center of whatever is being considered or done at all. Now, I'm going to read that again. I want you to listen to it very carefully. Now, listen to it. It may not seem very important, but listen to it. And especially young people, just listen to this. Old people listen to it too. And Christian and non-Christian, listen to it. All of our problems, whether Christian problems or worldly problems, they come from removing Christ from the center of education, of whatever whatever's being considered or done. I'm going to say education with it. But let's leave the Christian thing now. Now let's say this. All of our problems... In education, come from having removed Christ from the center of education. Now, it started 100 years ago or so or more, 120. Now, we're reaping a whirlwind of it right now. Christ has to be the center of education. Now, if you're a Christian, you'll understand that in a minute. And I say to you that the Bible says that God poured out, he poured into Christ all the riches and treasures of wisdom and knowledge in him. Or to take you another familiar passage in, in uh, let's see, John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him, without Him, there was nothing that's been made, that was made. Now, what is the Word? The Word is the communication. The Word is the education. The Word is information. Jesus Christ is the incarnate information period he's the center of all education your education is worth nothing cosmically if at its heart Christ is not there economics if you remove Christ from the center of economics and you got what what we've got today and we're facing economic disaster but we are right in the middle of it not just an issue, the world right now is just being destroyed. All kinds of, of uh, all kinds of frightening, horrible scenarios are being written on our economic future, sociologically. Well, we already touched on that. Christ is no longer to a moderator force at all. In fact, for many people, the church is is a passe thing. God is Christ is dead, and Christ is a folk hero. You know, that's all got to change. Whether it's church problems or whether it's social problems or, or remove Christ from the center of it, everything must be accorded to Christ. Now, I'd like to talk about almost everything in every branch of life. It's I'd like to talk about criminology.
like I said, I want to talk about criminology as well. Now, we, we can't build jails fast enough to put people into them. We can't put penitentiaries put together fast enough to keep up with it. The incorpor- incarceration business is now falling and has fallen into the hands of entrepreneurs, of private entrepreneurs going into the business of building jails. Uh, the jails we have are overcrowded. Why? Because the people are going there all crowded. The laws are sitting there. People. Why are they going there? You know, it's a vicious circle. But once you study what the Bible has to say, you said, but that's the Bible. Let's, let's talk about Christ now. You must understand that the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, is the word of Christ. The Old Testament isn't the different word from the different God. It's the same God. The Bible says the Old Testament prophets spoke because the Spirit of Christ dwelt in them. He is the Word. He is the Old Testament Word. He is the New Testament Word. He is the Word of God. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, everything must be according to Christ. You, you, you say, you're a dreamer, aren't you? I don't think I'm a dreamer. I'm a reader of, of the Scripture of ultimate reality. Is what I'm, I am. I, I'll give you a Scripture of Christian that you can latch on to by faith. Ephesians 1, chapter 1, and verse 10 says this. God designed, God has designed in his purpose to gather together in one all things in Christ in this age and, and the fullness of time. You said, well, how can that be? You just, you, you just decided a liturgy and woes a, a few minutes ago. That's right. Now, I want to ask you, how things are going to change. Are they going to change? Yeah, they're going to change. I, I believe that concurrently with the program of righteousness. and um, It's a program of righteousness. There's also an unrighteousness that goes along. John says another interesting thing about this too. He says concerning Christ, when he came, does the light shine in the darkness and the darkness cannot arrest it at all. Now, as sure as God's word is true, darkness must be ultimately defeated. And right must be ultimately victorious. Now, you said, well, against the dark background of everything you said and what you painted, how can you talk like that, Mike? There's another scripture that's very interesting as well. It says that this world must be wax old. This world must wax old like a garment. Now, there's a sense in which God's letting man run the gambit. He is. He's just, he's running and running out of steam. It's what he's doing. It's what it looks like anyway. Now, I remember the pre-atomic age, a little bit, but it was at my time. I remember back, looking back at history, that was the age of which we waged conventional wars back then. Then came that atom bomb, boom. Now, we were all hanging over us all the time, and over our head here, that we can't handle because we have, we don't have the intellectual or moral capacity to handle it. We can't. If people do things, they'd just be freaked out all the time. At the same time, there are about 43, 35 wars across the world, conventional or unconventional, but they're still wars. Man's busy tearing up his clothes. He's wearing them out. He's wearing them out quick, <laughs> waxing up his garment. And when he gets completely worn out, God will say to him, all oh, man, we're all, are you exhausted now? You ready to say, Uncle? I have to say this carefully. But, but there is a sense in which God is going to, uh, concurrently as man wears out, God is taking advantage of this. He sure is. Do you remember when Israel was given, he was to be given Canaan land? He was. And he said to Abraham, he can't have it yet. Because the cup of the Amor- Amorites, well, it's not full up yet. I read that and wondered. Now, some people are very upset about God sending Israel in in and kicking all those people out of Canaan as though God had done something indecent to them. It, it's a celestial police action. It was. Uh, people don't like that. And what had happened in Canaan was this. These people, had they bastardized everything that was decent about humans at all. But God had to wait till their cup was full so that he could righteously say you have squandered every right to live here now you got to go 
Now, there's a sense in which God is waiting for the cup of America, the cup of the Americans, the cup of the Russians, the cup of the Chinese, and, and the cups of... <laughs> well, there's a lot of cups being filled up, and they're getting there quick. And he's got an army waiting in the wings. He always does. I want to touch on two of these midst statements. The first one is this in the midst. Jesus, when the Lord Jesus was taken by his parents for the first time to Jerusalem. Now, if you read much about Jewish history and much about the customs of the Jews and the ways of the Jews, you'll find that Jerusalem, for them, was a very sacred, holy, it's a romantic, exciting place. Even now, much more so back then, but in those days, when Israel was still laying claim of being God's people. Well, they had a long forfeited the right, they already did that, to be that people because of their conduct. There remains what Isaiah calls, in the midst of them, a remnant. Now, in the days of our Lord's birth, that remnant consisted of people like Anna, Zechariah, and Elizabeth, and Mary, and Joseph. You can imagine Jesus being raised by Mary and Joseph. And undoubtedly, both Mary and Joseph poured into this young man, developing a mind in all of the rich tradition of their Israelinish, if you want to call it that, their Jewishness. In their heritage, they, they talked about the city of David. They told him stories about the time that David and Israelites, they took the heights of Jabus and, and cast the Jebusites down and established the name of God in the heights of Jabesh and, and called for the place of the Ark of Zion and called that place Zion. And his young eyes were bulging out as you hear the stories of his traditional background. Now, as the years went on, Jerusalem became more and more desired to him. He's just desiring it. At the age of 12, he was taken up to Jerusalem for the first time. And I can imagine that this young eyes who just, they just couldn't take all of it in. You know how it is. It's just it's everything. They say the days of the feast back then, it is was early day history, and indeed, even in Jesus' history, in those days when people would come from all over the world and all over Israel to Jerusalem, that it, it was something to see. They said the Feast of the Tabernacle, for instance, one of the free feasts that was attended by all of Israel was the high point. It was the highest point of national joy. One rabbi said, no really, no really understands joy until they've been to the Feast of Tabernacle. Now, many of the psalms are psalms of aspect, the songs of the Israelites that made their way to Jerusalem. Even in geographically, they were coming down to Jerusalem. They never went down to Jerusalem. They always went up to Jerusalem. You always went up to Jerusalem. Whenever you read in the Bible, you never read about anybody going down to Jerusalem. You don't. There was a man who went down to Jericho, but that was a boundary. Jericho's a type of the world, right? You never went down to Jerusalem. You go up to Jerusalem, and as they come up to Jerusalem, they could hear them singing and shouting as they came from every direction, making their way to that great feast in that holy city. Well, well Jesus came, and I'm sure that Jesus feels his little eyes full and his little ears full, and he wooed and he awed, and he went around and looked at all the historic sites, and he checked out all the things that Mother Mary and Joseph had told him. And the time came to go home. we got to go home now. Now those days, they were very involved in the family. They were. They went up to it in caravans, but family. And the uncles and aunts and the whole bunch of them. and They were all mingled together. Well, we did that when I was a kid. And they started from home. And, and this would come as a surprise to, to some of you, especially mothers. Mary didn't bother to check on Jesus. Is Jesus in the caravan? Well... They got three days down the line, and she said to Joseph, I haven't seen Jesus for three days. Joseph, I haven't seen either. Joseph said, I haven't seen him either. It's, it's over if he's with Cousin Elizabeth, or maybe 
he's over with Uncle Isaac. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe he said, let's go look around. So they went around to look around through the little caravan, and they couldn't find Jesus. Well, I said, well, we must have left him in town three days. <laughs> I, I've, I've never done that. But I had I had no people who had done it. Just left the kids. <laughs> just missing. Their kids are missing. They call you. Where, I left them at the store. I left them at the church. I left them here. And uh, it's funny. And they freaked out. And the baby was crying. Said, I've seen him just crying. Where you left me? I forgot. So they went back and hunted for Jesus. And maybe he'll be hanging around the temple. Maybe. Okay. Let's go. Let's go find out. He's a religious boy. And let's go find him. Mary's boy, Jesus. Now, a lot of Christians, they have celestial views about Jesus. They humanize him all the time. Jesus was Mary's boy. You know, Jesus used to go to the meetings like he used to go to the synagogue with Mary. And this, John, one good morning, Jesus he was mourning. Good morning, Mr. Jones. Miss morning, Miss Smith. <laughs> Jesus went on into the synagogue. He's a good boy, and he's a fine boy. He's a little different, but he's fine. Mary, mother, especially since Joseph, back, he's doing good real well. He's doing good in the carpet shop, too, especially since he put that new sign up there. Better. We make better yokes. Come, come we make better yokes. Come and get one. One of the most exciting things to me about the study is that well I, I believe that Jesus according to the creed of God's very God and man of every man he's man of every man he came down for us men he took on the likeness of sinful flesh he was a nine month old baby he was born with all the humiliation and difference in humiliation and physical pain and physical birth he was raised subject to his parents he learned in his human mind, even though he was the repository of all infinite wisdom, there was something different about him. I'm sure everybody observed that and saw that. There's something different about Jesus. He's a good kid. He's got kids. Not bad. He's a good kid, but there's something different about him. He was different. He was a boy. Uh, yeah, I'm sure that Mary, I think that Mary must have known wouldn't she? After all, she had some severe suspicions about this as to exactly what was going to happen to this boy. No idea. Somebody said, "What? Well, well, didn't she know what happened to him? I, I don't. I don't think so. Apart from, from what the word says, I don't think that she had any technical definition, really, to describe a virgin birth. I don't think she knew." Well, one in her womb at all, technically, she couldn't she couldn't write it out for you in biological jargon. She couldn't tell you. She just knew that she had become pregnant apart from a normal order of reproduction. Period. It's, it's all, it's, uh, what I read was, you know, I, I don't know. Th did she know? She probably never understood, probably never will, just what happened as the power of the highest came on her and the Holy Spirit overshadowed her. And that thing was conceived in her womb was the Son of God. Well, actually, when she gave birth to that holy child, beautiful, she watched curiously at that time. I'm sure she did. She'd always know what to make of him. But the Bible says that she was, he was subject to them. That's an amazing thing that God would create a, in the heavens and the earth was subject to a human mother and father. Well, and so they come back hunting for him and figured he's being around the temple somewhere. Sure enough, there he was. He was, he was in the temple. The temple was big. It was a vast place. Some scholars said could accommodate 200,000 people in his various precincts even. But eventually he found Jesus. And where was he? He was, he was 12, 12 years old. He was sitting in the midst, in the midst. That's what the Bible says, in the midst. He was sitting in the midst. Now, see, 
told you, Luke chapter 2, verses 46 and 47, you'll find it there. He would sit in the midst of the rabbis and the doctors and the scholars. Now, there was, there was a 12-year-old boy sitting in the midst of all these bearded rabbis and their beanies. And, and, and these men were discussing. And they, they discussed Johnson and Kittles and little things. These men who dissected words and analyzed dogmas and doctrines and pronounced great, great requirements from the Jewish people. These are the leaders of nations. This is a 12-year-old boy sitting there, and he's he's talking now. And I, I, I want to disabuse your mind of all these thoughts of disrespect. He didn't have any. I don't think for a minute that Jesus was showing off at all. I, I can't believe that the very, he wasn't baiting these old guys and getting talk, talking to them to death, fighting. I believe mean, he's a respectful young Jewish lad, but he was asking some very precocious questions and, and waiting for the answers. And he'd ask the question and they'd look at one another. And I imagine that the little side view would take place. And they'd sit and talk for a little bit. And Where'd he get these questions at? Now, the, the answer was, <laughs> to that, where are we going to get all the answers to this stuff? What was, the, what was he doing in the midst of the area? He was in the midst of, of the area that would be described for them as truth. So the first thing I, I want to say to you is this. Jesus has to be in the midst of truth. I'm sure that some questions that he asked those rabbis were questions that had to do with their own manipulation of the scriptures. And even though he did not respectfully, he did it respectfully, he confounded them with it. And they said, we don't have really have a sincere answer to what you're saying. Now, I say this carefully to all of us. When you and I put Jesus Christ, the Son of God, at the heart of our personal philosophy, do we have answers for some of these questions that we ask, or even what we have? What's true? What is truth? Jesus said that later. What is true? At the age of 12, when his parents came back for him, he said, Wish you not that I might be about my father's business. Well, what was his father's business? Let's go to the end of his life and find his own answer at that. Let's, let's see. We talked about it a minute ago. He's from the pilot now. It's recorded in John 18, 37, and 31 through 35. For this I have been born for this. And for this I come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Ah, Pilate said to him, what is truth? But Pilate didn't wait for an answer at all. What did Jesus say to, to that reason? For this reason, I come into the world to bear witness to the truth. So, the first time we meet Jesus, he's sitting in the midst of the rabbis, talking truth and talking about truth, respectfully, as a 12-year-old, should be presence of his elders, but nevertheless, resentless. Resentlessly, I believe so, out of this little young mind, he, he is posing questions that are confounding these men that are supposed to be champions of the truth, but who have long since abdicated their place as truth teachers and truth preachers. There, there is the very first time we find him saying, Sir, may I ask you about this? May I ask you about that? What about this? What about that? What was he doing? He was saying, we, I have to get into the muddled philosophy of men, whether they be religious or whether they be otherwise. i got to get into to them because I have come to bear witness of ultimate reality. I've come to bear witness of what is actual fact of years. For years I've tried to, to answer Herod's question, what is the truth? I, I wanted to, to get some kind of verbal definition of that to satisfy me and maybe satisfy other people. What is truth? And I came to this one conclusion. And I adopted it. And I'll give it to you. It's very simple. I have a habit. I've encapsulated them. I encapsulate everything. Things like this to help me. You know, beginning and end. Put it in capsule. Simple stuff. Because I'm a simple soul. What is truth? What's the definition? It's the actual state of affairs. As, const as contrasted with rumor 
and false report or mythology. The actual state of truth is the actual state of affairs with contrasted with rumors or false report or mythology. Now, what does that mean? What does that actual mean? Actually, what is this actual state of affairs? Uh, as contrast to rumor, uh, how many have ever heard of rumors that that purported to be true? All of us have at one point or another. We've heard rumors that were reported to be true, and and we thought, no, oh, they are true. And some of us have repeated those rumors as truth. And then day, we found out they were true at all. And we need to readjust at that point our whole position on that particular thing. And it may be big or maybe small. All this time we've been calling something truth that wasn't truth at all. Why wasn't it? Because it wasn't the actual state of affairs. They say, oh, that's 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 that's, that's a hard say. <laughs> yes, it is hard say. I hear the people, pardon me for trending on your dangerous and controversial ground, but I don't have any prejudice other than the prejudice of God's infinite desire that I hear constantly ab I, I hear said about abortion so that women has a right. It's her body. It's her own body. That's not true. There's not any rights. She doesn't have any right with her own body. A man hasn't any right to his own body. The only one who has a right to our body is God. And our bodies must be running terms of the revelation of his intention for our bodies. That's why I am where I am. I don't have a right to do with my body what I want to do with it. Uh, if I abuse it, and I have, I get in trouble. I have no right to overfeed it, to abuse it. I have to starve it. I can't expose it to danger of my body. It's God's body. Jesus' body is Christ. His His body was Christ's body. I have no right to my body. My body's not even mine. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Well, you said that's rich of Christians. Well, who do sinners belong to? The devil make their bodies? No. The devil may never need anything except a mess and a nuisance. The devil's not a creator. He is he's, he's, he's an arch, <laughs> arch enemy. I mean, he can copy better than anybody in the universe. Well, he, he can't copy. Yet he just makes fraud out of it. He twists it a little bit. He comes at you with a counterfeit. Now, 12 million, 14 million, number amount of abortions, and more than that now, 28 million. There's, each abortion represents a woman who said, I have a right to do what I want with my own body. That's not the fruit and truth of millions and millions of people dedicated themselves to a false report, dedicating themselves to a rumor that they have a right. Well, let's take premarital sex. Okay. Now, there's nothing. I got saved at 29. There's nothing I haven't done here. Not abortion, though. You don't cleave until you leave, right? Cleave until your wife. But you have to leave first. Somebody said it's all right, though. Uh, cry out first. That's what the Bible says. Try it out first, right? That's what the Bible says. As soon as we put Christ in the center of things, of all things, we call truth today, would tear our, our philosophies completely apart and tear them to shreds. I have this awful passion as I grow older now, right now. I want to put everything, believe, to, to the test of Christ. And I'm not dedicated to s sacred science. Sacred science is changing. I'm dedicated to the one who changes not. I'm dedicated to the ultimate fact, the ultimate reality. Jesus said, I am the proof. I am the proof of philosophy. Any philosophy, proof. I am the proof, Jesus said. Any philosophy that doesn't have Christ in the heart of it is false philosophy. I don't care what it is. Whether it's Contra Abel. I don't care who it is. If Christ's not in the center of it, it's diabolical. You see, that's extreme, Mike. Well, not as extreme as I want it to be. I, th I think a lot of things are very diabolical. And I want to be more extreme. I'm saying to us, as Christians, we've got to be trailblazers about this. We've got to be the ones who apply the test of Christ to, to every aspect of our philosophy in the beginning of his ministry. He was in the center of truth. That's where he was with the rabbis. In the temple. At the end of his ministry, he stood meekly before Pilate and Herod. And he didn't have to, but he did. For this reason I come into the world to bear witness 
of the truth. Now, what's truth? Well, Dr. Moffat in his translation, Moffat's translation, he says, truth is reality. Truth is reality. Well, I like that. In John 1.14, that Jesus said, full of grace and reality. They translate it that way. Grace is beauty. Jesus was beautifully real. There was a a decorum about him. There was an order about Jesus. And there was a reality about Jesus as well. There was no phoniness about Jesus. Jesus was pure. Really, there was pure reality. Was, there really wasn't any phoniness. There was no mental reservations. There was no hypocrisy. I don't believe there was any double, triple, and tantras. He was straightforward about what he said. He was. I think he was clear-cut. He was God. He was God. Now, he is the test of truth in everything. Now, I want to read you this verse from, from, from Colossians chapter 2. And I'm reading it from the J.B. Phillips translation. And it reads like this. Verse, chap, verse 8 in chapter 2. Chapter two yeah. Be careful that nobody scores your, spoils your faith with, with false intellectualism and high-sounding nonsense, such as stuff best founded on man's ideas and the nature of the world and disregards Christ completely. It's not according to Christ. Now, I'd like to say in the beginning, according to Christ is being according to the Scripture. That's why I believe in creation. That's why I, I don't believe in evolution. I don't have a problem with creation. No problem. I have a lot of problems with evolution. You can't prove it yet. It, once it deposited God inside of this, I had no problem with creation. In the beginning, God. It's far easier to grasp intellectually for me to grasp that. Now, I remember the Bible is ultimately rational. It's far easier to grasp in the beginning God than it is to to ascribe to the Big Bang Theory or the Egg Theory or the he's climbing out of the slime theory or some hypothetical offering. It's far easier. People attack the miracles of the Bible, but their their viewpoints on the miracles are harder to believe than the miracles themselves. They <laughs> they say that when the children of Israel come across the Egypt, that that manna was really a sort of it grew in the bushes, in the wilderness. Well, okay, that's interesting. Now, can you prove that? Make it agree with the scripture, and maybe God used a natural thing, but that's not what He said. You see. You still haven't got me out of the miracle business at all. Because there's three million people who've got to be fed every morning on these little bushes. Now, every morning, the heads of the household, whoever, the wives, whoever they were, who collected the eggs, yeah, not the, or the manna, not the eggs, excuse me, they, they got to collect enough manna for that day for three million people. Uh, they can't collect enough for the next day. They're not there. How are they going to do it? It's an amazing thing is this. We accept that theory overnight that that bush grows a whole new crop of manna. I'd rather far believe that it was baked with angelic baked in ovens of heaven and, and filtered down through the night and landed in, on in the wilderness. That's what I believe. Covered with the dew so that they could wash it down easily with the dew. They come out and collect it. The Bible calls it angel's food. The Bible calls it manna. Food from heaven, angels. Why? Because they didn't know what it was. Manna, what is it? Manna. When they went out, they said that. What is it? I don't know what it is at all. And they called it, for that morning, that means, what is it? Manna. <laughs> That's what it meant. So everybody expected their, what is it? The women all exchanged recipes about how to prepare, what is it? And they, they cried and did everything, parboil it, parboil it, did everything they could to have baked it. Raw and made soup out of it also. What is it? It's far easier for me to believe that. Now, let's go to the Red Sea thing too. You got the Wall of Jericho, you got the Virgin Birth. Uh, there's all these things. You gotta take it all or leave it. I, I'm gonna take it. If I leave it, I don't have anything but a mess to believe in. It's nonsense. It is. I've thought it all over. Now, I'm saying to you, instead of us being apologetic about it or being obscurant around Christians, and that's what we are, we ought to be right out front with it, from saying, I believe that Jesus Christ is the ultimate answer to everything. The Bible says so. As he revealed himself in the totality of Scripture, 
And if I take the scripture of any given problem that we're facing, I will have the mind of the ultimate reality and solve our problems right in front of me, and the Holy Spirit will help me to solve these problems. Now, we don't study Christ in the light of in the light of other things that that uh, that take the forefront. We study it in the light of Christ. I don't have a problem with with what the Father wants from Christ. It has pleased the Father that all things Christ should have the preeminence. I want simply to say to each of us tonight, right now, that we're listening to this, that we're all playing the fool if we take Christ out of the midst of our philosophy. I'm not out of date because I'm a Christian. I'm eternally optimistic. I'm upbeat. Today, Christ is the incarnate Ultimate reality is not outdated. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, that isn't speaking of Jesus Christ's person. That, that speaking of Jesus Christ is that's what he stands for. Jesus Christ is the Word. He is the vocalization. He is the incarnation, a manifestation of God, omnipotence and omnipotence. And all of God's attributes are in Jesus Christ. Is He's the world's answer. He's the light of the world. He's the light of life. He is... He's got the answer to all of them. Every answer. He's got the answers. Period. Don't be ashamed of that. Because when the day is finished, all done, smoke clears, we'll be Christ. He'll be standing there. Just That's it. If you haven't made that up, you just get with it. I'm concerned, and I'm feeling that the popularization and get the gospel over, we got to turn aside to all kinds of entertainmentism or, or, or get along with society, which is ungodly society, now, if we, got, if we walk with that horses of Egypt, that we water down the, the uh, impact of the gospel and the impact of Jesus Christ's ultimate reality in the hearts of men, both Christians and unchristians, is in the midst of the truth. You can't water that down. You can't get rid of him. He will not go away, believe me. Now, why would he go away? Because he is the ground of your being, whether you like it or not. All things. <clears throat> were made by him and for him and without him there wasn't anything made now the most vilest sinner in the world tonight is the result of God's creative through the word of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit so that the sinner lived by the common grace of God he breathes by the common grace of God he blasphemes by the common grace of God he commits, he commits sexual sins by the common grace of God he gets drunk he gets overdosed on drugs by the common grace of God. He would breathe anything without the common grace of God and life. It would sustain him in all that. Paul went where the, where the people were. He went down to the Agora. He went down to the market, right? And the only reason the Greeks went to the market was to, it was to buy cabbage or cauliflower or a bouquet of roses. They went down there to talk. Talk about their philosophy. Every Greek talked about philosophy. And Plato was there, and Socrates was theirs, and, and they all went through there. And so Paul went down to Agora. He knew he could get that a place where he could get a conversation going, and he did. Uh, he went down to the Agora, and he was listening. And he heard a group of people in a conversation. They were composing a story of Epicureans, and they were all having a philosophical argument about it. And he went over and he listened. But he's trying to get in on it, too. And he was going to, praying. Now, they had opposite philosophical viewpoints. Neither of them had Christ, though. And so Paul began to say some strange things. He said, what are they talking about? Are you a spar? Uh, no, no, not really. Are you Epicurean? No. What are you? I'm a, I'm a believer of Jesus Christ, a follower. Who is he, he said. He started talking and confounding he talked and they said well, you're too much for us right now we'll take you up to the Greeks and the Greeks seemed to intimate they grabbed him up and they by the slaves they grabbed him and said come over there we're going to go up here and they took him up to Mars Hill where all the big shots were and and they put him up there and he started talking to them right in the 17th chapter of John it's marvelous he said let me tell you about something about Paul was Paul was not him for a moment not for, I don't think for a moment intimidated by the traditions, the wise 
breathe, not for a moment. They were so smart. He stood for Jesus Christ. He said, God now commands every man. He said, no, God commands every man everywhere to repent. For by one man he's ordained that they, he's going to judge everything. And he said something. He said, God has established the boundaries of the nations and their times, period, and the time cycles, period. And then he told them why. Now, can I say this to you carefully? The nations, they didn't just happen. Nations were made by God. That's what it said. God made nations. God made families. God made tribes. God made social entities. God set in the groupings. So we'd be manageable in groups. Now, Paul said, by the inspiration of the Spirit, he said, by the inspiration of the Spirit, he said the only reason that God maintains a nation, uh, this is going to be awful hard on some of you, if, if, if you know your culture and so forth, some, so God keeping America because of our superior culture, no, God maintains this nation because no one wants the truth. No one wants the truth. But do you want the truth or do you want a rumor? You put that rumor in your mythology. Here's the truth. He's, he, Paul said this. God, is fit, God has established the boundaries and the time cycles of the nations. If happily, they may seek after God. If they seek after him, he established them to seek after God. He said... Do you mean that God isn't keeping us going because of our great sculpturing and our, our beautiful woodwork and artwork and our literature? And we're so good at doing this, so good at that. You mean that God is not maintaining us because of our tremendous creativity in the realm of technology? Oh, no, 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 no. The only reason God is keeping social boundaries, and sociological boundaries, and in fact, is this. Paul said men would take advantage of his common grace and seek God. That's the bottom line to the whole reason for living for God and living tonight. Let me just go on to one more in the midst. Now, in the midst, truth, in the midst of truth, now, I'm not, I'm not going to give an altar call about this. I'm not going to challenge you in the, this tape. And before we leave this point, I want to say this. Bill and Jerry, Mary Jo, teenagers and college students, I guess, they challenge you, everybody listening, I challenge you to put Christ in the midst of your philosophy of life and see what he does there. See what he does for you. There, there's no deathbed in this. There's no, well, actually, there's no deathbed story that... that uh, it's not the bravado with the voice. I watched it, and the lowering of the lights, and then that looking at your right, the black of your eye. I'm not telling these these uh, things at the end of this. You're doing yourself an eternal disservice if you don't put Christ right in the middle of your philosophy and uh, your relationships, your philosophical aspects of your marriage, your philosophy of family, your philosophy of of, of business, philosophy of Society, your philosophy of politics, your philosophy of education, your philosophy of science. I don't care what the aspects of your philosophy is. We're talking about the philosophy of science, maybe. I don't care what aspect of your philosophy of where you're talking about to, about anything else. You're you're doing yourself an disservice, a disservice completely if you don't put Christ in the middle of everything, of everything you can, and ask him what else you need to. How many understand what I'm saying to you? And I've been saying this for years to people. Obey him and put yourself right in the middle. Put Jesus in the middle of everything you do. Read the word. Read the word. Read the word. It's in the word. Now, this is the second one I want to touch on in the midst. And I've touched on this about ten times. Uh, let's look at it real quick. Okay. Now. John the Baptist was standing knee deep in the murky waters of the Jordan River. And his daily pulpit, <laughs> the Jordan, it's right in the middle of it. And he looked up one day, 
and he saw a figure it kind of attracted him and he said well um, this figure came towards him as we see here he started down to the water Sean remonstrated said no I can't baptize you he said you you, you better because I want to feel unrighteousness Jesus said to him so he got ahead and he got down to the water the Bible says I'm reading for John 129 the next day he let me say this let's go to 26 first and then John answered them saying I'm going to baptize you with water but he's standing where in the midst whom you know not he said and the next day John said he saw Jesus coming unto me saith unto them now listen behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the within of the world now that great vast crowd of people stand in the banks of the Jordan and John says in the midst in the midst of you right in the midst of you right in the middle of you is a man and and there's a man he's the Lamb of God and he's going to take away the sin of the world where was Jesus he is yes, he was in the midst of truth of the rabbis he was in that crowd he was in the midst of that crowd in the midst of sin now that was the beginning of his life it was that was in the introduction of his life the introduction now let's go to the end of the life as we did with truth at the end of his life I'm reading again from John I'll read from John 19 55 excuse me John 18 talk about the crucifixion he crucified him with two others with him on either side of him and Jesus was in the midst it was in the midst Jesus was in the midst between these two thieves all through Jesus life you find him where in the midst of truth in the midst of sin he was always in the midst of it his sins be forgiven he said now pick up your pallet and go home he said to him right in the midst of the murk and the mire and the mess all down through the mess, he got into it and if you're down into it you can get washed off and cleaned now that's how it starts and that's how it finished now when he was in the midst of two thieves and that fact of that that's kind of the sin edge of the wedge isn't it listen to the declaration of Paul about that whole thing the crucifixion listen to this that God made him be the sin for us all who knew no sin that he might be that we might be the righteousness of God in him now what happened on that cross God stood down he stood down and he ladled up the sins of all time and world I don't know how he did this but he put all sins of forever put it on Jesus Christ and he became the center of the cosmos and then God drew back his arm and let the lightning bolts of his wrath come purling down his son who gave his soul a sacrifice for us Jesus Christ is he became that sin so I don't uh, I, I won't want to be I don't like it and people don't want me to talk about that, that that Jesus was nice and good and loving and sweet and we keep him from sin you don't understand he came to the world to save sinners that's me I thank God he came here that's me he came here to be in the midst of sin he came and found me in my sin and this is the truth until you get Jesus Christ right in the middle of your sin problem right in the middle of your life you 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 disqualify yourself for so many different things and do yourself with such a disservice such a great disservice now listen to me I haphazardly said these things and it, it's just it's been on my mind a lot for 40 years Jesus saved me he is saving me and he will save me I thank God for that he's in the midst